today we're going to be looking at a question that once considered is actually quite understandable. And it can be phrased as this, why is God such a narcissist? By narcissist meaning someone who is deeply obsessed with their own prominence or beauty. An egotist, if you will. The question arises when we begin to look at the practice of prayer within the faith traditions of our world. This may not seem strange at first because of the cultural background that we have to the process of prayer, yet when we look at prayer, it often consists of the praising of God, the constant speaking of the glory and beauty of God. And it is understandable when you consider it that some individuals find this peculiar. Why? Well, why would a divine being, the ground of ultimate reality, need to be told over and over how wonderful he, she, or it is? Why is it that we say that God is the all-powerful, the all-knowing, the all-wise, the omnibenevolent, the most beautiful, the most glorious? It seems, from one vantage point at times, that this is really a divine being that seems to need to be told that they are the best over and over and over again. So what is going on here? This is what I often call the peculiar practice of prayer. This facet that God needs to be told how awesome he is over and over and over. Now, of course, in addressing this, we have to assume that there is a God. Very often, when religious questions or theistic questions are actually approached, there is an underlying and unstated assumption that there is no God. Then, of course, prayer seems completely bizarre. We have to assume the principle, for the sake of the argument, that there is a divine being, an underlying ground of all of the good, the true, and the beautiful. Before we kind of move into some of the different facets of this, we're going to look at some aspects of prayer first, and then get into, if you will, the question of why prayer. Within the Baha'i writings, work, service, and arts are actually a form of prayer. What does this mean? So in this quote from Paris Talks, it's interesting that the arts, the sciences, and crafts are all actually forms of prayer. Yet there is a condition of this. To the best of his ability, conscientiously concentrating all his forces on perfecting it. That is the condition of giving praise. It is in a sense that when the heart and the mind are oriented in a certain direction, that of one's own perfection and the benefit of humankind, that any act can become praise. We are told, for example, the arts that when someone is putting their paintbrush to a, a tapestry, when an individual is trying to explore the sciences of music, that that too can be prayer, as long as that is actually directed toward the uplifting of humankind and the perfecting of the self, which I would submit is actually one and the same, because the perfection of oneself is actually carried out within the field of service. So here the Guardian is telling us that the core of all religious dispensations is this mystic union between God and man that is chiefly carried out through the means of prayer. Also cited here is meditation. Now, it says here that the soul of man is first to be fed. That afterwards, those, if you will, social aspects of the faith are what flow out of that inner wellspring of a belief and relationship with the sacred. If, in fact, God is omniscient, all-knowing, does he not know what we already want? This is found within the Baha'i writings, but here I chose other dispensations long in the past to explore. What is pertinent here is the state in which this is being done. That prayer and service should not be done for others to see what you are doing. Rather, they are to be done in a spirit of humility and sacredness, in a relationship with the divine. It says here that your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now, of course, the question is, then why is it that we are carrying out this process of what's called petitionary prayer? The asking from the divine court what we hope for within this world. 
Once again, we have this concept that God, and as far back as 3,000 years ago, is aware of our needs and our desires. The sighing is not hidden, all my, all my desires are before you. So what is happening here? What is the process, or what is the purpose of the process of reaching out? I will offer two quick thoughts. There, the first is, is that it is natural for one who is, if you will, impotent to reach out and beseech aid from that who has power. It is not a demeaning aspect to reach out and ask for help is not somehow a lessening of a person, but a recognition of their own status. That reaching up one's hands to their parent, a child is not declaring their powerlessness, nor stating that the power that the parent, sorry, does not know what the child needs and longs for. It is a natural expression of the human heart and mind. This is a theme that's going to re reoccur multiple times. At the same time, there's something else that happens. That when one is supplicating to the divine court, to the beloved, to the friend, this causes the request to be assessed. It is very common for us as psyches to have our hopes, our desires, and our longings rolling around, if you will, in our mind. Yet when we approach in prayer, especially when we have actually honored and recognized the station of God, and attempted to reach our heart and mind out to this being, and then our prayers, or if you will, our requests, sorry, our petitions are placed within that court. What happens is, and I know this is very true for myself, um, that the mind suddenly questions what is being asked for. There's a process in which, before you place your petition before the king, you begin to ask, is this worthy of request? What are my intentions? What are my purposes? Are they pure? That the process of petitionary prayer, not only a natural expression of a limited creature to an unlimited realm, also has a function, a function where the heart begins to look before it is actually placed before the divine court. It is a means whereby our hopes and our desires and our requests become, if you will, assessed, weighed in the scales of justice. Is this something I should be asking for? When they rattle around only within the head, that can happen. But if you will, you're thinking of what you are going to ask for the king, and right before you enter into the court, there's a natural sense in which, should I really be doing this? Are my intentions pure? So there's a function to petitionary prayer, not only of a reflection of one's status, but also of the very desires themselves. I find this quote fascinating. One, because it addresses a natural and understandable objection from the secular or atheist camp, which is if you are praying, or for that matter, acting, out of hope for some reward in the future, that of paradise, the carrot, or avoidance of some consequence, the stick, the fire, then this, if you will, mars or stains the very act in itself. And this is not a notion that is actually external to sacred scriptures. This is something that is built in, that the heart should be focused not upon the reward or in aversion to the punishment that it should actually be being carried out for the sake of its beauty alone. Otherwise, it actually turns it away from its original intent. That's why it says here, it should be regarded, not be regarded as an act by the dedicated to the oneness of his being. If the gaze should be on paradise, that would make God's creation a partner with him. So when one is praying, and one is praying for the hope of paradise, that hope is not for God, and for that mystic communion which the Guardian talks about, but rather for some benefit to the individual who is actually praying. And this is, in a sense, what Jesus Christ was saying in the Gospel of Matthew, that if we are carrying out charitable acts, or if we are praying so that others see us as noble, 
so that others see us as high, then our reward has been given in full when they do. But rather, it should be done in private, and should be asking that the God's will be done. This next section I call Building Your Best Self. The first point I would like to make is the secularization of the covenant. At times people have asked me, how is it that we can carry out a life of peace and wholesomeness? And very often I've said, well, imagine if every morning you woke up and you filled your heart and mind with the most beautiful ideas, words, and concepts you can think of. That if at least once during the day you were to take a moment in silence and declare your dedication to the highest standard you could ever possibly conceive of, but then were to sit in silence, in a state of meditation, if you will, somehow representing that ultimate standard to which you're aspiring. That if, like the first thing that was on your mind, were those beautiful concepts, those wonderful attributes and qualities that lie within you, that the very last thing you had on your heart, in your heart and on your mind, prior to sleeping on your pillow, were those same concepts, those same feelings, those same sentiments, those same purposes and goals. I would add one further thing, that if throughout the course of your day, at the very end if you will, you were to sit down and take account of the day in which that you had led, asking where you might have faltered and trying to understand what it was you were seeking at that time. And to look also not only at those things which are, say, if you will, failings or shortcomings throughout the day, but also take stock of the victories and the beautiful things you had done and try to really settle them in your heart to see that this is who you truly are. And then end your day with those images of the beautiful, the good and the true. Whenever I have said this to friends, uh, People have said, well, that's actually very beautiful. To which I then respond, well, that is the daily covenant of a Baha'i. I wake up in the morning and I read the writings of Baha'u'llah, of the Bab. I read scripture. I try to sit for a moment in prayer and in meditation prior to the opening of my day. Throughout my day, I, like in the Gospel of Matthew, take a moment where I enter a private place free from the eyes of any other individual. And I say what is called my obligatory prayer. I recognize my station and the height of the divine court to which I aspire. I then sit for a moment in quiet meditation and try to represent through symbol that emblem of that reality to which I'm aspiring. These are my 95 Allahu Apas. God is most glorious. And I try to represent in my mind, and I try to represent those highest standards to which I'm aspiring when I do this, and envelop the world in my conception of the oneness of humankind. At the end of my day, I try to take account of my deeds. Baha'u'llah says, Bring thyself to account each day, ere thou art summoned unto a reckoning. So we are to bring ourselves to account each day. I myself, and this is my own practice of this, this is not a, a standard, I try to look at my shortcomings. I then ask myself what it is that led me to those. What was I seeking? What was the underlying beautiful principle that I was hoping to achieve and how did I fall short? I then try to look at and celebrate the victories that I had throughout the day. When it's actually placed in this framework, and made abstract as opposed to the particulars of this is the Baha'i Daily Covenant, usually individuals say, well, that's very beautiful. Likewise, I'll say, it's kind of like taking a bath. That prayer for me is trying to place my heart and soul in a state of being where my mind is focused completely, as completely as I can, on God that representation 
of the ground of all that is good and true and beautiful, the ground of all power and capacity. That it's as if I walk in and I let or strive to allow the hindrances of my day, those which hinder me from being my best self, my most beautiful station, and let them wash away. It's a time when I suddenly realize and remember, if you will, in the hustle and bustle of every day, what my life is supposed to truly be about. We're creating this bubble, right? Where our state is of the utmost spirituality and radiance, where we're allowing those qualities that we are praising to enter into our heart and mind. Abdul Baha is talking about how we take account. And this is actually in the morning, where we try and say, am I in a state where my belief is stronger, my heart more occupied with God, and my love of humankind greater? That I look to that which was my shortcomings prior, and I ask for assistance to become better than yesterday so that I may continually make progress. It is, once again, this concept about building one's own better self. So this process of prayer is so that our we do not look to our own respective capacities. That we open up our heart and mind to those intangible attributes, justice, mercy, compassion, sacredness, integrity, that can be embodied within ourself. And we look beyond our simple seed, solitary though we may be, not look upon our own lack of power. That's actually what the process of prayer is attempting to do, to expand out our heart and mind, so that we can see that there is a wellspring, a resource that we can turn to, that can be summoned and manifested within our own lives. So the process of prayer is the opening of our ears. The process of prayer is the unveiling of our eyes, so that we can see the radiance. So that we can hear the melody, clearing our senses so that we can perceive the fragrance of what we can be. The concept is, is that there is actually an intangible ocean of attributes and beauties and glories awaiting for the human psyche to access. They are not forced upon humankind. They have to be besought. They have to be sought after. So the process of prayer is attempting to open the fullness of what you are to this ocean of attributes that can be accessed for the enlightening of the world. The world itself and all its, if you will, petty desires, distracting influences, more baser nature, not can but does infect us comes into our hearts and minds, and it makes us choose lower choices than we would if we were solid and firm and stationary. The process of prayer is the reminding of ourselves that this is the purpose of human existence. The acquisition of the glorious attributes of God that we praise within the prayers that we pray. The purpose of their coming is the freedom of man from himself. We are a being in the writings of all the religions of God that stands between the animal and the angelic. The process of prayer is the direction of the rational soul of humankind towards that higher nature. That all scripture, all prophets, all study, all divine philosophy is to take these burnished mirrors that are ourselves often dirtied by the processes of this world, and to make them mirrors that can reflect the light of the Divine Realm. The summons of the manifestation of God in Abdu Baha in this passage, when we are to be forgetful of self, does not mean at all that we don't look out for our own well-being. It is that we look out for our own well-being for the purpose of serving humankind that we can rise up and sacrifice ourselves in the true sense, that we can actually seek the highest goals, the most beautiful purposes in existence. 
he strongly urges you not to dwell on yourself. And then when he actually terms that, he says, each one of us, if we look into our failures, makes us feel unworthy, despondent, and it frustrates our constructive efforts. There is no... Obviously, any individual should know their shortcomings, know what we're trying to better. But it is this fixation on our shortcomings that is actually... We're actually told to avoid. We're supposed to be looking to what we can be, to be looking to this ocean of attributes, to be opening our ears, our eyes, our senses, all of them, to the reality of God beyond the limited self. And it even says here that you have no right to feel negative, you embrace this cause and you're risen to serve. So you should be a veritable lion of confidence to look past the single, if you will, photon and realize the light of the sun that is actually carrying you. We've heard these expressions about prejudice, materialism, our lower nature. And to be frank, the world in which we live at this time is so geared towards us focusing on those prejudices on consumerism. And I would even add that we have a natural proclivity to focus on the physical. And by that I don't mean physical acquirements, if you will. But we have a high tendency to believe that reality is wholly and entirely material and physical, in spite of our hearts and minds constantly moving within realms of ideas and concepts of virtues and qualities. That prayer itself is to take us out of this state. To walk into a bath, to a shower, to give us a moment to remind us of our true purpose. This brings us to a concept that I touched on in the video, Atman and Brahman. So any comparison we can make of the Divine Court is applicable only to his creatures. That's the first quote. And it says that man will advance and develop till he attain the station with which our inmost true self hath been endowed. And this is the purpose of the prophets of God and his chosen ones. So the purpose of the prophets of God and his chosen ones have, have been to do what? To evince such powers as born of God and such might as only the eternal can reveal. To carry emblems and tokens and signs of the inmost reality of our self for us to see. Baha'u'llah here states that were he to praise God for the length of thy dominion, that praise would only befit such as are like unto me. Now the question is, is this relating only to the manifestations of God? Right? When we speak of the power of God, these words are only adequate to the same likeness of nature of ourselves. Continuing on. No matter what we do, the devotions of the holiest of saints and the highest expressions of praise are what? There are but a reflection of that which had been created within themselves. This is often a peculiar notion to some people. But when we are attempting to say that something is brilliant, something is so knowledgeable, we're trying to stretch our mind into that conception of what it means to be all-knowing. Yet that's an idea and a picture that we create inside our own mind. That all-loving, it's like if we sit and just ponder love and try to strain our mind to actually see what love is. We're going to be, if you will, creating this conceptual bubble within our own psyche as to what lovingness could be. But whatever that bubble is that we're actually creating and ballooning out inside ourselves is something that is a conception of our own self. It's somehow a reflection of what is the potential within our own spirit. So this brings us to the concept that if this is this process of the holiest of saints, the profoundest of thinkers, are but a reflection of what's inside us, this opening up so we can see just a drop of the ocean of attributes, it means that we get to see what's in our own self. 
This is from the very first selection in the book of Gleanings. <clears throat> so whatever duty God has prescribed to humankind of extolling His majesty is so that we as human beings can be enabled to ascend to the station conferred on our own inmost being. Again, the station of the knowledge of our own self. So when it comes to this concept of the narcissism of God and why the divine court, the divine being, the divine friend needs to be told all the time how glorious he is, the purpose is so that bubble, if you will, that space of seeing the sacred is constantly flexed and expanded because, as we saw in the previous section, it's a reflection of what's created in our own self. So therefore, through the process of prayer, which necessarily is to be directed to the Divine Court, we get to have an experience of what we really are. Quite a different conception from this idea that we're just telling God how great He is all the time. Rather, it is this fundamentally mystic process of trying to become a veritable lion of confidence through the process of seeing within ourselves the realities enshrined in the image of God. That process best facilitated by prayer and meditation. This is such a vital concept. Very often, we're trying to find ourselves. We're trying to find who we really are. Yeah, the concept is, is that we are made, and this is with, that we have our own Buddha nature. That we have our Atman, which is a reflection of Brahman. And the image of God is placed within us. And the image of Christ, or the image of Krishna, they are shining within us. And the focus here is to move out beyond ourselves. In a directional sense, our true self is not here, it is a reality out there that we move towards. And how we best do this is by serving our fellow men, serving humanity, and search for God, that representation of the sacred that we are but an image of. And that when we do this, the process of service, which is prayer, through art focused on the upliftment of humankind, which is prayer, from work in service to humanity, which is prayer, through the expression of our highest self, we then begin to find ourselves, which is the embodiment of these qualities, that ocean of attributes to which I was referring. We have this, this idea of finding ourselves, but it's actually through the process of expanding beyond ourselves, of opening up that definition of what we are, to being beyond us, that that's actually how we do this best. The key, the master key to self-mastery is self-forgetting, the path of renunciation. What Shoghi Effendi in the previous quote called one of the great spiritual laws of life. The more we search for God, the more we find ourselves. Those concepts we have that we can conceive of, no matter how far we stretch our mind, are concepts within ourselves. And this is actually necessarily true, because they're conceptions that you can encompass, that you can embody. I've often made a joke at Deepenings and Firesides. It's like when, when, I think of, when I think of God, it's like I don't believe that I'm God. God is the all-knowing. And I truly don't know how many pairs of socks I have. <laughs> the, <laughs> so the concept of, un, un, of all-knowingness, if you will, is so unfathomable. I can't even really, really imagine what it would be like to know everything at a local library, let alone all of reality. This concept, once again, is the idea that the image of God lies within us, that that can be best uncovered through service, acts of worship. This is from the Svetasvatara Upanishad, from the Hindu scriptures. 
as gold covered by earth shines bright after it has been purified, so also the yogi realizing the truth of Atman becomes one with the non-dual Atman, attains the goal and is free from grief. And when the yogi beholds the real nature of Brahman through the knowledge of the Self, radiant as a lamp and having known the unborn, immutable Lord, who is untouched by ignorance and its effects, he is freed from all fetters. That it is the process of seeking Brahman that enables us to see that shining brightness within ourselves. The book of Genesis, chapter 1. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The New Testament, 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 18. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. In each of these cases, there is this reality, in some sense, in some sense ineffable, in the end that cannot properly be expressed, yet at the same time it is the process of attempting to express it and to praise it that it unfolds within us. That this is the function of prayer. Prayer itself, while it can often be represented in ritualistic forms, it itself transcends all of these forms. It's like the idea, if you will, is not the piece of paper that it's on. The idea is not even the brain that's currently holding it. It's not the MP3 on which it's recorded. Yet that's how we experience these realities. We experience these realities within the tangible world because it's the only way we can. Yet the reality of what it is is far beyond that. It is truth. It is reality. This is the same with our own self. We might have these processes, these functions that we carry out through asking from God what we hope for, which performs the process of defining our station as below, yet at the same time submitting to the court our requests so that they are weighed in the balance of our own spirit, of praising God so that our mind expands and we realize the ocean of attributes out there unto which we can have access, that we turn away from our lower self unto the image of God which is reflected within us, so we find ourselves more, by carrying out work and arts and sciences and service in the process of serving humankind and finding the beloved, the ground of all truth, of all beauty. I want to move now to a different section. And this is about the expression of love. In the highest prayer, men pray only for the love of God. Not because they fear him, or hell, or hope for bounty or heaven. When a man falls in love with a human being, it is impossible for him to keep from mentioning the name of his beloved. How much more difficult is it to keep from mentioning the name of God when one has come to love him? A spiritual man finds no delight in anything save the commemoration of God. I love my wife, and I deeply love my children. I love my friends. I do not praise the beauty of my wife Jenny because she wants me to, or she needs to feel better about herself. I do so because that's what love does. I tell my children I love them, yes, it benefits their hearts and little minds, but I don't do it to gain their love back. I don't even necessarily do it to uplift them, although it might do so. It's because that's what love does. It expresses itself. It's like a fountain that pours out. I think this is something that really has to be pondered on, not just heard. The example I've often given is, you imagine standing, say, 
on the precipice of the Grand Canyon. We're looking out with a friend at the images from the Hubble telescope. Imagine any case you can where you're looking at some glorious and wondrous vista of reality. Something that just captures you in the moment and you see such beauty. Maybe it's a child laughing. Someone who's actually playing an exquisite violin concerto. A gymnast floating and flying across a floor. A dancer. She was any of them. In fact, she was all of them. <laughs> and look at each one of them. Now imagine you're standing beside someone. Say, I'm standing on the verge of the Grand Canyon. Or looking at a glorious starry night in the middle of nowhere. And I say to my friend, Wow! That is absolutely beautiful. Isn't that breathtaking? And my friend next to me says, well, it's just a bunch of rocks. Or if staring at images of the Hubble telescope, who cares? This is a bunch of you know, nuclear fission gases and stuff. It's just cold, dead stuff. I guess not cold in the case of stars. <laughs> but imagine now again, you're listening to one of the most beautiful violin concertos. Just picture like a young kid playing this exquisite piece. And you're like, wow, isn't that beautiful? And your friend says, so what? I think if you, if you consider this in each of these cases, you wouldn't be, well, okay, well, you know, that's his opinion. There would be some sense, and I will say in my case, there's a sense in which I'd be thinking, like, what's wrong here? There's some faculty or some quality that is lacking in my friend. Maybe they're depressed. Maybe something's happened in their life. They have major stressors, or there's some emotional flatness, something has occurred, and I would actually be concerned about them. And I would try and urge them to see that beauty. Why? Because there is beauty there. And there is an inability to appreciate it. And when I see a beautiful gymnast, an amazing guitarist, a violinist, when I see an amazing waterfall, a beautiful field, a wonderful nebulae, <laughs> there is a natural innate sense of a desire to express, for me, that appreciation of that beauty. There's just an innate welling up of a need to express my awe of beauty. To express my awe of the power even behind something. The sheer force of Niagara Falls. The amazing power of nature. I believe this to be entirely and completely natural. And actually it's a part of becoming a true and genuine beautiful being is to be able to recognize that beauty. So I would submit that after all this process of looking at prayer, that the universe, if you were to imagine all its waterfalls, all its grand canyons throughout the cosmos, glorious galaxies, amazing star chambers, beautiful life, the unfathomable diversity of life, the arts, the sciences, the love of children, and all this reality, I would submit deserves at least once a second. A moment where a heart pauses and says, wow, where they actually feel and vocalize and express the beauty and glory first of that thing, but then moving beyond to the source of all that beauty, of all that truth, of all that glory, of all that power. So I believe that when we come through this, that prayer itself is one of the most natural, natural and understandable expressions of a human heart and a human mind in recognition of the reality in which they truly live. Thank you very much.